He has 20 years experience in natural medicine. He's medical director of the natural doctor that specializes in natural medicine. As well, he specializes in breast health, uh, anti-aging and bioidentical hormones, uh, natural cancer support. He's been sought after public figure and he's won Who's Who uh, award for medical achievement. So everybody, let's give a round of applause to Dr. Nigel I have to say this topic probably is the thing that I'm most passionate about, really. Because um, when I came across some of the concepts that I'm going to share with you this evening, uh, my first question, both as a scientist and as a physician, was why on earth is this not available to women now? And that was 14 years ago when I started doing this. I could not believe that we couldn't accept the concept that surrounds some of the things that I'm going to share with you. That title that you see there, Changing the Game in Breast Cancer, is I truly believe that we have the facilities, the capacity, the knowledge to change women's risk of breast cancer significantly. We have the tools, we have the knowledge to do it. But a lot of that currently resides outside of conventional medicine. And you'll understand where I'm coming from as I go through. So, without further ado, this is actually a thermogram, and so is that. And I'm going to be talking a bit more about this. And this is a lady who has breast cancer on her left side. So I want you to just note the difference in patterns that we see there. We'll come back to that a bit later. All right, well, this is going back a few years now, but are we still saying in 2017 that the best we can do to reduce a woman's risk of having breast cancer, if she has a genetic risk, like Angelina Jolie has, of course, because she carries the BRCA gene, which increases her risk of breast cancer, up to 80% and her risk of ovarian cancer about 30 to 40%. So she chose to have a bilateral mastectomy and then subsequently had her ovaries removed. But when I, this hit the press, I remember speaking about this and lecturing later and, and, and then and when I gave the first draft of this lecture that I'm sharing with you tonight. And I posed the question, is this the best that we can do in modern medicine? to protect women, is that if they have a genetic risk, remove the breast tissue and remove the ovaries. Really? So I set the scene with this. Let's look at some background to the whole breast cancer uh, story. About 50,000, this was 2014 figures, 54,000 new cases of breast cancer in the UK annually. So it's about 50,000. Lifetime risk, we now think, is about one in eight. It's the same in the US. 2002 figures, about 33 women die per day in the UK from breast cancer. Just think about that for a minute. Every day, 33 women will die from breast cancer in the UK. It's the commonest cancer in women in the UK. Every three minutes, on a global scale, a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, and every 12 minutes, a woman dies from it. That's on a global scale. The highest uh, age standardized incidence is in North America. It's about 87 per 100,000, compared with about 11 and a half in China. Now, what does that tell you straight away? Diet. Pardon? Diet. Uh, yes, diet. Or more specifically, what? Could be. Yeah, it does. Doesn't it suggest? that there may be some environmental, cultural things that we should be talking about. All right. It's estimated that if you, uh, you have double the treatment success, if you detect a cancer when it's localized, as opposed to when it's already spread. And that's good. So early detection is the key. And we know that 30% of breast cancers occur in women less than 50 years old. When, ladies, are you called for a mammogram in the UK? Pardon? Age 50. But, but a third, roughly, of breast cancers occur before that. So what are we doing about screening younger women? 
All right, so within the last, in fact, Richard Nixon was the one who very boldly stated in the 1970s, he said, by the year 2000, we will have defeated cancer. Well, unfortunately and sadly, he was wrong. Because if you look at the general statistics, can solid cancers in men have increased almost 50%. Uh, cancers in women have increased by 41%. Prostate cancer has increased 100%. And breast cancer has increased 80% over the last 40 years. So that is not winning the war against cancer. Yes, I did have a mammogram today. Why do you ask? I know that's rather amusing. Isn't it amazing what you can find on the internet? But for those ladies who have not had the experience of having a mammogram, this schematic shows how it's done. You basically have your breast squashed between two plates, and the reason for that is to, is to press the tissue out over a bigger area so that when it's exposed to the ionizing radiation, the, it's easier to see any abnormal tissue in an area that's been spread out. Okay, so that's the principle. But women say to me who've had a mammogram, it's like having your breast squashed between two fridge doors. It's not a painless experience. And furthermore, uh, oh, that was just to give, give us men an appreciation of, of what the procedure may feel like, okay? But look, <laughs> it does bring tears to your eyes, doesn't it? Okay. So this was published in the uh, European Journal of Radiology uh, back in 2012. And it's a, a rather a sobering paper because what it shows is that when women experience mammography, they, they found or they tracked circulating epithelial cells and circulating tumor cells in the bloodstream. And what she showed is that when women have mammograms, guess what happens? The number of circulating tumor cells or circulating epithelial cells goes up in the bloodstream, suggesting that the compression of abnormal tissue might be a concern. What are the statistics? And these are, nobody argues with this now. It's extremely well published. What do we know about mammography and what we're achieving with it? Well, for, here are the stats. For every 2,000 women screened over a 10-year period, one life would be saved. That's his screening mammography. So for every 2,000 women screened over 10 years with mammograms, one life would be saved, but 10 healthy women would have unnecessary treatment, meaning mastectomy, chemotherapy, or radiotherapy for cancers which would not have been a threat to their lives. And 200 women would face the psychological distress for many months because of false positive results. So those are the stats. And they're the, they're the stats that have led us to question in medicine and science how really is mammography an appropriate tool for screening? Are the risks outweighing the benefits? Well, here's more recent uh, research. This was published in British Medical Journal in 2014. And this was a, a large number of women screened, 90,000 over 25 years, found that mammograms have absolutely no impact on breast cancer mortality. And then what about the Cochrane Collaboration Review that was published in 2013, which again analyzed all the data. And when they took all of the data together, they seriously called into question whether mammography screening really benefits women. So it's not just me that's saying it. The latest published science of large numbers of screened women does not support that mammography is saving lives. In fact, what it's showing is that it's leading to women being overtreated. Now, uh, Peter Gurch is one of the leading lights uh, in, from the Cochrane Foundation. And actually, uh, this was a commentary that he wrote a few years back. And I've extracted the key points that he made. It's worth us going through them. He says, screening with mammography, and by the way, he's written a book on this. He says, screening with mammography does not reduce the occurrence of advanced cancers. Rigorous observational studies in Europe have failed to find an effect of mammographic screening. 
Uh, mammography screening produces patients with breast cancer from among healthy women and increases the number of mastectomies performed. That's what we already said. The most effective method we have to reduce the occurrence of breast cancer is to stop screening, he says. Now, he also says in the same commentary, if screening had been a drug, meaning mammography screening, it would have been withdrawn from the market. Thus, which country will be the first to stop mammography screening? And so let me ask you, which country has been the first to stop mammographic screening? Switzerland. Switzerland. That's right. Approximately two years ago, based on a peer review group reviewing all of the evidence, including an oncologist, a breast surgeon, epidemiologist, nurse practitioner, lawyer, reviewed all of the data for one year. And then they concluded we can no longer justify offering mammographic screening to our population in Switzerland because it does more harm than good. They're the first country to have the guts to stand up, acknowledge the data, and act on it. So my question now is, which is the next country that is going to follow suit based on the evidence? And we, it's a hypothetical question because I don't know. Um, uh, but hopefully it will trigger a chain reaction. All right. Now, uh, ladies, I want you to note this down. Note this. This. I'm going to give you time to actually write this down. Because I want you to go to the Cochrane uh, website, and I want you to, it will take you, if you go on this link, it will take you to this page, and you'll see something called, yeah, take a photo, that's a good idea, why didn't I suggest that? You see, I'm a bit behind the times, aren't I? Take a photo. <laughs> right, so if you go to this link, you'll see this uh, at the far right mammography leaflet. And it will allow you to print off this PDF, which tells you, ladies, exactly how it is. It, this is an informative document that all women who are contemplating a mammogram should read, so that at least if you still choose to have one, you are making an informed, a properly informed decision. Because I'll tell you why I'm bringing this up. Because one of the criticisms of the Swiss study which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the criticisms was that women are being still being misled and being made to feel irresponsible for choosing not to have a mammogram. And the fact that that is happening, the Swiss said, is not right. So therefore, I'm pleased that the Cochrane published this so women can download this, and most of you in this audience probably didn't even know about this. But that's why I'm pausing, so that you can access that. And when you've read it, pass it on to all of your lady friends who you care about, and even some of those that you don't care about. Because it's about time that women were informed with the truth. OK, a few more facts about mammography. It's late detection, and I'm going to show you why it is. By the time you can see it, it has to be the size of a small grape or a small olive by which time it's about 500 million cancer cells. It will have been developing for six to 10 years to get to that size. So r that fact alone tells you that by the time we can see it on a mammogram, we're six to 10 years behind where we should be. It's a test of anatomy structure. It has to be big enough for you to, to block enough x-rays for you to see it. And if it isn't big enough, you ain't gonna see it. So a few facts. We know already it doesn't lead to any survival advantage. It's late detection uh, because it has to be big enough for you to see it. A third of mammograms give false positive readings, uh, and a third give false negative readings. <clears throat> uh, it has low sensitivity in dense breasts, and about 49% of women have dense breasts. And the younger you are, the denser your breast tissue, which is why mammography is not offered to younger women because their breast tissue is too dense to see an abnormal structure within that. So that's why it's not offered and why it's offered to mainly postmenopausal women or women who are perimenopausal. 75% of biopsies are negative. So in other words, a structure which looks abnormal on a scan and is biopsied, well, three quarters of them turn out to be false positives anyway. 
in other words, but you've had the biopsy. And there is some discussion and contention around what about sticking a needle into a breast and you don't know what that is? Is it a, a malign structure? Would that help to seed cancer cells out? A lot of debate, um, but it's, a, it's an important question. Each mammogram, because it's radiation exposure, increases a premenopausal cancer, uh, premenopausal woman's risk of cancer by 1% because of the radiation exposure. And as that's another reason why, if you're not menopausal, really, we shouldn't be offering mammography to those women. Uh, it has reduced sensitivity, that's mammography, in women who are taking HRT or have a family history of breast cancer. And those are two groups of women that we particularly want to screen. But it has reduced sensitivity in those women. 10% uh, of patients with breast cancer will have a normal mammogram. And there are published concerns over the compression of existing cancers at the time of screening, and I've already touched on this. It takes 22 pounds of pressure, we think, to rupture the capsule of a tumor. But the average pressure that you're exposed to, ladies, at a mammogram is about 42 pounds of pressure. So you see why there are debates and concerns over that. Now. Another reason why its late detection will become clearer on, an, yes, this, on this next slide. This schematic kind of shows where we are at and where we want to be. Because right now, with mammography or ultrasound or MRI, we, we're only able to detect with a resolution of about one centimeter. Sometimes you can detect something smaller, but not reliably. But you see, I've already said, by the time by the time we get to this, it's been there for six to ten years usually, depending on how rapidly that tumor is growing. So on average, it takes about six to ten years to get to this size before you can see it on a structural scan. Really, we want to be measuring down here, don't we? We want to, the desire should be to detect when something is down here or even earlier, before, maybe when it's precancerous. The other fact that I want you to note is we, be, we know from scientific data it takes about five years or, or from a cell becoming a malignant cell before it has metastatic potential, meaning five years before it has the ability to spread. Well, if it takes five years from the time it becomes malign to when it has metastatic potential, and we're detecting six to ten years after... Uh, and do you see the problem with that? Is we're detecting too late. Now, how do we know that what I just said has some factual, has some truth behind it? I'll tell you how we know. Because when you take women who have had what we call a wide excision uh, removal of a lump in the breast that we thought was a single tumor on the scan, and they've had four centimeters of tissue taken around that supposed single tumor, we find in two-thirds of them multifocal deposits of cancer in the surrounding four centimeters. But it appeared single on a scan. That's not early detection. It's late detection when two-thirds are all spreading outside of what we thought was a single focus. So I think from what I've said so far, you can see some of the dilemmas that surround the story with mammography and why it's not proving to be a successful screening tool. It's the reason why, 14 years ago, <clears throat> I challenged this and decided to do something better. And that's what I want to continue to talk to you about now, because I really think we can change things. Now, if we're talking about a, a good screening tool, let's just stick with that for a minute. It needs to have the following qualities. Any good screening tool, it doesn't matter whether it's a scan or a blood test, it needs to have high sensitivity for small cancers, meaning you're, you can detect small cancers. It must be cost effective, which is one of the questions about MRI. Is it cost effective because it's expensive? And we don't yet know how effective it is anyway. And it needs to be safe and acceptable to the population being screened. Those are the things that we look at when we look at, is a screening tool a good one or not? So let's talk about thermography a bit, because I know some of you don't know about it. What is it? Sorry. Thermography is looking for heat coming from the breast tissue. 
Now, back as far as the 1950s, a guy called Lawson, Dr. Lawson, discovered that breast cancers generate heat. And he was able to, to see that the breast cancer generated heat, but the surrounding tissue didn't. So he was probably the first to describe that in the 1950s. Arguably, before that, Hippocrates found that a pathological area dried first when you spread mud on a patient. So that meant that the hotter area was drying first, right? So there's something about pathology and heat, and there's something definitely about cancers that we know generate heat. Why do they generate heat? Because they're highly metabolic, for a start, so they're more metabolically active than normal cells. That generates heat. And also, most cancers, in order to nurture their growth, have what we call an angiogenesis, or new blood vessel formation. And that increased circulation nurtures their growth, but also generates heat. Useful if you're looking to detect heat and not structure. So what is thermography? Basically, infrared camera that picks up heat coming from the body surface. That's what it does. And we now have the technology to measure temperature differences right down to 0 0.025 degrees centigrade with modern digital infrared thermography. So highly sensitive equipment. Has it been approved? Well, you might be surprised to know that the FDA approved it in 1982 to be used alongside other screening tools. And yet, half of you in this audience didn't even know about it. What are the differences? Well, I would argue, and the studies would support, that it's early stage detection. We think it gives us a six to 10 year advantage over mammograms. Why? Because we're looking for physiological change heat generation from a, a smaller tumor or maybe even a precancerous lesion. So we're looking for heat, we're not looking for structural change. And so that's what I said there. We're recording these metabolic, this metabolic process. An abnormal thermogram is the single most important marker of high risk for developing breast cancer, and I'll show you some data on that in a minute. It is 10 times more significant than having a family history of breast cancer. Just think about that for a minute that if you have an abnormal thermogram, the studies support that, that it, you are, you are ten, it's 10 times more significant than having a family history of it. Uh, studies have shown that if you combine thermography with mammography, it can lead to a 61% increase in survival rate. So we shouldn't be just throwing this out of the window because that's what some of the studies have shown. It's also 100% safe, risk-free. There there's no radiation. It's only detecting heat coming from the body. No ionizing radiation. And, ladies, no compression required. So it's like having your photo taken, um, except we're using an infrared camera rather than a, a normal camera. And here's the other beauty. It can be used to screen young women because it doesn't matter how dense the breast tissue is. We're not looking for structure. We're looking for heat changes. So we can screen younger women. Bonus. So earlier detection, measuring heat, can screen younger women. Two early detection advantages. And you doctors in the audience will want to know this, I know especially. Is it scientifically validated? Well, uh, there are over a thousand peer-reviewed studies on breast thermography in medical literature. And some of these have followed patients for up to 12 years. And for those of you, I don't have time to cover all of them, but I've written two review papers on this. So for those of you who are technically minded and, and want to know the science, you, you talk to one of my staff after and we'll send you a PDF of those articles, should you want to see those. I'll be touching on a couple of the key studies now. And that's, look how long ago that was, 1982, Spitalia and his associate. They screened 61,000 women with thermography over a 10-year period, and they were able to uh, identify or pick up 91% of non-palpable cancers. In other words, cancers that could not be felt. Thermography picked up 91% of them. All right, let's move on. What about this study? Again, published in the 80s. Look at that. This is Gross and Gauthry. They screened 58,000 women with thermography. And the ones that had, and these were women that did not have a clinically palpable tumor. And they followed 
over 1,500 of women who had healthy breasts but an abnormal thermogram. Now, healthy breasts just mean you can't feel anything in the breast. But they had an abnormal thermogram. So they followed those uh, for a number of years and then reported that of this group, this 1,500, 40% of them developed breast cancer within five years. Now, you may say, well, that means 60% of them with abnormal thermograms didn't develop breast cancer, but that's only a five-year... Unfortunately, the paper didn't report beyond that, because I would have wanted to know, well, what happened at 10 years? What happened beyond that? Don't know from this study. But at five years, 40% with abnormal thermograms had developed a breast cancer. So it's high risk. What is the sensitivity and specificity of the test? I know that sounds a bit gobbledygook to, to, to some of you. Sensitivity means true positive, and specificity, specificity, quite difficult to get your lips around that sometimes, specificity means true negative. That means, uh, what is the chance that if it says it's positive, it really is positive, and if, it, and if it's, how specific is it, is if the test says it's negative, how confident can you be that it really hasn't missed anything? In other words, true negative, okay? Those two are very important for a screening tool. And for thermography, we think, uh, uh, based on all of the scientific data, somewhere between 90 and 95%, compared to mammography, which is somewhere between 60 and 70%, just for comparison. All right, uh, what, is it a good screening tool then? Let's see. Well, any technique for screening must have. Does it have high sensitivity for small cancers? Tick, because we're not looking for structure. Is it cost effective? Tick, because uh, one of these units is relatively cheap compared to mammography. It, you just need a small infrared camera linked to a laptop and a normal room that can be cooled. It's not expensive to set up. Now, some of you ladies will be saying, well, how much does it cost to have a thermogram? And the answer is, if you come to our clinic in, in Harley Street, which I hope some of you do, we charge 200 and... For, 45 pounds. What? Not tonight. No, I know we'll come on to that. Some special <laughs> offers going around tonight uh, for you. But uh, just think, I know some of you would have been thinking that. Uh, is it safe and acceptable to a population being screened? Yeah, because there's no radiation exposure. So, based on these three criteria, thermography gets a big tick. Now, I want to show you some examples of uh, thermograms. The first two are normal and the following three are women who have breast cancer. So you might wonder, well, why is a woman who has breast cancer having a thermogram? Well, I asked them kindly if they wouldn't mind, because what I wanted to do is show an audience what a cancerous uh, uh, breast looks like on a thermogram. So let's look at these. Now, this is a normal one. You see the breasts are symmetrically cool. It's normal to have heat under the breast. It's normal to have heat heat like that coming from the armpits. There's a little bit too much heat coming from the neck there, but I won't bore you with why that might be. Uh, here is a thermogram as well, but it's a grayscale that allows us to see the blood vessels more easily, and that's important. So that's one of the things that we sign on. We look for temperature differences. We look for abnormal blood vessel structures. Now here's another normal one, and you can see the breasts are symmetrical, uh, the cool, this cool around the nipples, and the grey scale doesn't show any abnormal blood vessel. Those dark flecks are blood vessels, but these are normal pattern. Right, the next three are women with breast cancer. <coughs> Which side is the breast cancer? You're looking at this like a mirror image. It's her left, right? What I'm showing you this for is look at the abnormal blood vessel patterning here. Look at the amount of heat that that cancer is generating compared to the non-cancerous breast. It's obvious, isn't it? Now let me show you another one, different patient. Look at that. Now you can see, it's obvious here, this lady has got structural changes in her breast. You see the nipple is retracted up. Look at the vascular density around that. That's abnormal compared to the other side. Look at the heat that's being generated by that cancer. Here's another one. The other side, look at this. Look at the vascular supply to that tumor compared to the other side. And look at the heat being generated. So there's no question that, that 
when you have an existing cancer, heat is being generated. What we're saying is, of, of course, for these ladies, that was it's too late, a detection. But we're saying that if we can pick up some of the early temperature changes that suggest there is a stressed breast or a malign process evolving, that gives us an opportunity to get involved with that lady and change things much sooner. You follow that argument? All right. Good. Okay, so this is the system that I have, have, have developed, and uh, I've used different thermal image systems over the last 14, 15 years. This is my own system that is a computer-assisted uh, thermography system called Thermacheck. And here you see a, th a thermogram being done. This is one of my staff who's here tonight. There she is, she's famous. <laughs> So Rachel is doing the screening. Look at the size of the camera, how small that infrared camera is. It doesn't require a big camera, a very sensitive uh, uh, piece of equipment, that is, and linked to a, uh, just a, a normal computer screen. And uh, uh, Thermacheck is different because we let the computer analyze all of the temperature data. So it's not a doctor sitting in front of a screen eyeballing it, which is the way it's done in some places still. But you might as well let a computer analyze all of the temperature data. It's much more accurate and much quicker and much more thorough. So that's what we do. So um, Thermacheck is the name you want to watch out for. Now, th so what we do is we draw these grids around the breast that identifies to the computer 35 areas to compare right versus left. We let the computer do all that, much more sensitive. So, so that's thermography. And those are the reasons why I think it, it's a game changer. So let's now talk about how we can change risk. And then at, right at the end, I'm going to show you how I am and my staff are changing risk in women. OK, and that's the, mo the thing I'm most excited about. So what are the things that we know contribute to breast cancer occurrence? We know there's genetic. but. How may, what proportion of women who have breast cancer actually have a family history? Does anybody know? And it, just give me a percentage. What proportion or percentage of women who have breast cancer diagnosed have a family history of it? Yeah, you see, you got that. It's somewhere between 8 and 10%. Most people think it's more. But what does that mean? It means that 90, 92% of women who get breast cancer have no family history. That's a rather sobering thought, isn't it? Because everybody thinks, well, there's no family history, I'm safe. That's, we have to be careful of that one. And then what are some of the environmental factors? Well, we can talk a bit about estrogens, and we will. Really, this should be a three-hour talk, I have to tell you. If, for me to go through all of the aspects in detail, I, I would need three hours. You're not going to get that. You're just going to get a flavor. Okay. So estrogens, we'll talk about briefly. Aluminium in deodorants. Well, you find aluminium and other heavy metals in breast cancer tissue. What is it doing there? No one's saying it's, it's causal, but there's an association. So it's prudent not to be rubbing aluminium-containing deodorants, this is what I say, in your armpits, ladies, until we know better. And then, some of the li and then various aspects of lifestyle. We'll skim over these quickly. As you get older, your risk of all cancers increases, unfortunately. Uh, age at first pregnancy, the older you are, ladies, the greater your risk of breast cancer. If you breastfeed, you reduce your risk. If you're overweight, you have increased risk. If you have trauma and radiation to the breast, increased risk. Smoking, alcohol, increased risk. <coughs> Dietary fat increases risk. Animal protein, increased risk. Maybe more controversially, dairy can. Uh, if you read Jane Plant's book, definitely you'll say dairy increased risk and emotional factors, last but not least. And the one that is never on that list that you read in the textbooks is this one, nutrient deficiency. Seven, eight years ago, I had a, a major scientific challenge, which was a lot of the ladies who have abnormal thermograms <coughs> ended up having normal structural scans. In other words, I sent them for an ultrasound or a mammogram even because that's using mammography as an investigative tool, not a screening tool. Do you see the difference? So the Swiss, by the way, have not banned mammography. They've banned it as a screening tool. They haven't banned mammography. But they use it as an investigative tool, which is where it does have more merit. 
So a lot of these women who have abnormal thermograms, because it's early detection, you send them for a structural scan, comes back normal. So conventional hat says, nothing to worry about, off you go. We'll wait until something shows on the mammogram, then we'll react. Well, for me, that's an ethical dilemma, knowing what I know. Because if these women are truly at risk, I don't want to wait until something shows structurally in that woman. I need to be proactive and advise her what she can do to take herself off that high risk and normalize her thermogram. Would you agree with that? Yes. Good. Well, I'm going to show you how you do that, right? because that's what we do. So the important thing I want to emphasize is there are certain nutrients which are critical to breast health, which are largely being ignored by conventional medicine, but should not be ignored by women who are worried about their breasts. So the last part of the talk is going to be focusing on that and me telling you, based on experience, how you can protect your breasts, ladies, and how you can use thermography to demonstrate that high risk is changing to low risk. OK, so how do we protect breasts? Well, let me firstly show you this slide, which shows a, a cross-country association between intake of animal fat. And what it shows is that the higher in that you go with animal food intake or animal fat intake is the greater the risk of breast cancer. So number one piece of advice in prevention, you need to eat less animal and more plant. Now, I'm sorry if that upsets some of you, but that's just based on what we know, what's published data. Eat less animal and eat more plant. And I'll show you, I'll, I'll tell you more about why that is the case in a minute. Now, this is a very poor slide. I apologize. I tried to find a better one, but I couldn't. And what that's, this is just showing that hormone levels in ch rural Chinese women, estrogen is far less in their lifetime that estrogen exposure is far less than in Western women, but Western women have five times greater breast cancer and four times greater levels of estrogen. So estrogen definitely plays a role in breast cancer incidence, but it's not as straightforward as you may think. And I'll explain that statement in a minute. So here's the other thing that I want you to get. If you take a, a look at the science and published data, and I've summarized it in this slide, if you look at cross and there's a bit for men here as well. Breast and prostate cancer and association with food. Basically, all of the international published studies, published since 90s, demonstrate that a variety of food-based, plant-based chemicals, phytochemicals, are associated with reduced risk of breast and prostate cancer. Now, if you look at, and the studies have looked at carotenoids, uh, flavonoids, folate, total phytosterols, they've looked at those, and guess what? In all of those studies, there is an inverse relationship between breast cancer incidence, meaning that there is a reduction in breast cancer when you have more of these in your diet. So the take home message is from all of them is plant foods, phytochemicals reduce risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer. It might seem too simple a message, but it's actually based on quite a lot of scientific data. And if you source these from food base, it's so much better than taking them just in pure supplemental form. All right, so why do they work? And if you just, this slide just summarizes, if you take these three categories of plant-based nutrients or phytonutrients, this is what the science shows about these nutrients. They are antioxidant, they reduce DNA damage, they improve cell communication. I've put the ones in red that are relevant to, I think, relevant to reduction of cancer risk. They improve cell communication, they improve cell detoxification, they're anti-inflammatory, they boost immunity, they improve circulation, they upregulate mitochondrial function because we think that's one of the reasons that we get susceptible to cancers, mitochondrial function is compromised. They even alter gene expression. So if we can just flip back to BRCA for a minute, the fact that you might have a genetic risk, and we now know that certain chemicals, particularly phytochemicals, can regulate gene behavior. You get to see why we are not a sitting duck as far as our genes are concerned. There's the whole area of what we call epigenetics, which is that genes cannot turn themselves on or off. They are turned on or off or regulated by the environment in which they are. 
In other words, epigenetics is more important than genetics. So we are not sitting ducks to our genetic risks. And the message I'm giving you is that plant-based nutrients are some of the key things that regulate our gene activity. There you go, phytochemicals, guardians of our health. Good paper, that. I should have put the reference, sorry, I, I forgot to do that. I'm only going to cover this very briefly, but I want you to know the key thing, ladies. There's a lot of confusion about this, and almost every week the story about HRT increasing risk in breast cancer seems to change in the newspapers. But, you know, there are some facts which are solid, and they haven't changed over the years. So let me tell you what they are. <clears throat> this study was published by uh, Fournier et al. in 2005, and it was not surprisingly, not published in the press. <clears throat> but it basically looked at almost 70,000 women on different forms of hormone replacement therapy. Now, I should tell you that this, the findings of this study have since been corroborated by other scientists in Europe. But what this study shows tells you the, f the, the truth of the matter with HRT. And this is 2005. It should have been in the press. When ladies take estrogen alone, there is a slight increased risk of breast cancer, okay? That's what that shows. So estrogen alone, there is a slight increased risk of breast cancer. When you combine estrogen with a synthetic progesterone, look what happens. You see that? But look what happens when you combine estrogen estradiol, which is natural estrogen, with natural micronized progesterone. I said progesterone, not progestins. So progester what the scientific papers call progesterone, they're often talking about synthetic versions of it. In other words, progestins. There are these. Now, when you combine those with estrogen, there is an increased risk of breast cancer. But when you combine estrogen with natural progesterone, Guess what, ladies? No increased risk of breast cancer. None. You'd have thought that should have been front, line, front page press. But nowhere to be seen. So women can be given HRT safely as long as they're given estrogen with natural progesterone. It would stop the, the tide of breast cancer that has occurred with HRT. And that's been confirmed subsequently. We all now know, those, uh, those doctors, and there are some of you in the orders, who prescribe bioidentical hormones to women, we've known this, that natural progesterone protects breasts. And by the way, same study showed the same thing with deep vein thrombosis. When you combine estrogen with natural progesterone, there is no increased risk of thrombosis either. So the culprits are the synthetic progesterones combined with estrogen. That's where the problem is. Now, here's the other thing I wanted to show you, ladies. <clears throat> it's not just estrogen, but it's the way your body breaks it down according to your genetics. Because all women will produce either non-toxic <laughs> estrogen metabolites or toxic. The toxic ones can damage breast and uterus. The non-toxic ones are excreted in the, ut uh, in the urine. So it, how much of the toxic and non-toxic you produce is down to your genes, but you can measure that in urine. So if you are a woman who is producing a lot of these toxic estrogens, would you put that person on HRT? You see, that's where, this test is not done by doctors routinely, but it should be done when you're contemplating putting a woman on any hormones, especially estrogen, because you want to know how she's going to metabolize it. Is she going to generate toxic estrogen that's going to damage her estrogen-sensitive tissues or not? It's a simple urine test that's available to doctors if they bother to look. So here's the good news, and, and I want to come off this slide with a piece of good news. Even if you're a toxic estrogen producer, ladies, there is an easy way to switch you to a non-toxic estrogen producer. And this slide is showing something called DIM. DIM is from cruciferous vegetables, and what it does uh, uh, and what all cruciferous vegetable extracts do is they switch your, they influence your gene expression so that you express the enzymes that make you break down estrogen safely as opposed to this route. 
And I've seen that time and time again in my own practice. I've seen women go from a to being toxic estrogen producers to non-toxic over a period of three to six months, just by switching what they take in nutritionally on a daily basis. Would that reduce their risk of damaging their breast? Absolutely it would. And it's an example of what we call epigenetics or nutrigenomics, where nutrients are influencing gene expression. And this is, this is from the study, or one of the studies that shows this. This is a woman with breast cancer. Here's her surrounding normal tissue, not staining for these toxic 16 hydroxyestrogens. But here's a sample from the breast cancer tissue. And what you see is the cancerous tissue has, is highly stained for these toxic estrogens, but the surrounding normal tissue is not. So it doesn't mean it's causal, but there's definitely an association that we need to be paying attention to. All right. Nutrigenomics, that's what we're talking about. And it's not only cruciferous vegetables that influence this detoxification. Uh, exercise does it, ladies. Omega-3 does it. And iodine does it. Let's talk about vitamin D for a minute. How many of you in this audience actually know your vitamin D levels? Oh, quite a few of you. Uh, how many of you have got estrogen? Uh, estrogen. How many of you got vitamin D levels above 100 in UK units? A few of you. Good. Right. So you ladies are in the protective against cancer zone. If your level is not above 100, and I'll show you a slide in a minute, there's no, we can't guarantee that's protecting against cancers, and I'll show you that. So vitamin D is very important to breasts, and here are some some of the studies. <clears throat> Both observational studies in humans and animal models support that vitamin D has a beneficial role in cancer prevention and survival. Breast cancer is more common in women with low vitamin D levels. Low levels of vitamin D are associated with more aggressive tumors. All right. What about this study published from Crichton University in 2007? 50, uh, women who were age 55, over age 55, I beg your pardon, took just 1,100 units of vitamin D. Now, I would say that's still, in my book, a relatively low dose. I routinely recommend that people take four to 5,000 units of vitamin D a day with vitamin K2. You must take it with K2, otherwise you end up getting road calcification, i.e. calcium deposited where it shouldn't be, lining the arteries or kidney stones. That's not where you want your calcium, you want it in your bones, right? So taking it with K2 means you get bone mineral deposition of calcium and nowhere else. So, followed for four years, had highly statistically significant 75% reduction in breast cancer diagnosed after the first 12 months compared with women who took a placebo. Wow. That's a fact that women should know. That by taking vitamin D in decent doses, you're going to protect your breasts. I think women should know that, don't you? What about this? Studies at St. George's Hospital in London show women with low levels of vitamin D in their breast tissue have four and a half times the breast cancer risk. It's critical that women know this. But people are still, and doctors are still talking about vitamin D as if it only applies to bone health. Not at all. Another study showed that the lower blood levels of vitamin D, the more dense, i.e. more dangerous the breast tissue. So actually, low vitamin D is associated with denser <coughs> breast tissue which we know is an increased risk. And this is the study published last year, April 2016, looking at not just breast cancer, but the, the incidence of cancer plotted against doses of vitamin D. Now, what you want to see, this line here is where there are low levels of cancer. But you note that you only <laughs> get to that when your levels are approaching this, right? You follow that? Now that level is equivalent to about 100, 120 in UK units. What is the normal range in the UK? It's 50 to 200. So you see, you could go and see your GP and have a level of 60, and that's passed off as normal. Is that wrong? No, it's correct. You're in the normal range, but you're not in the range that's going to protect you against cancers. Do you see, see the problem there? is many people are being passed off with normal vitamin Ds that are not optimal and not cancer protective. But people who come to me don't get out of the door, number one, without having their vitamin D checked, and number two, if they're interested in their breast health, if they don't have a level above 100, 
I make sure they subsequently do for that reason. Okay? Little indeed. Well, how is it working? Interestingly, look, uh, and I haven't got time to dwell on this, uh, uh, the mechanism of action. Well, it has a role in regulating cell growth and differentiation. Differentiation is really a process that tells a cell what it's supposed to be, right? So that a breast tissue cell remains a breast tissue cell, that a liver cell remains a liver, etc. It stops the growth of, uh, growth of new blood vessels. That could be important. Significant anti-inflammatory effects of vitamin D. It activates genes responsible for programmed cell death. In other words, tell cells when to die. That might be important in turning off cancer cells. It is also able to activate cell differentiation, keeping cells regulated and well behaved. We now know that vitamin D, we think, regulates approximately between two and 3,000 different genes in the body. Just think back to what we said about Angelina Jolie and genetic risk, that vitamin D regulates two to 3,000 of our 25,000 genes. It might be important. Any of you want to read more about this, ask one of my staff. Happily send you this PDF, and I wrote that some years ago. Vitamin D, an underestimated ally. Talks all about this and cites the, some of the papers that I've referenced, if you want the, the reference material. Now let's talk about iodine, and I'm coming on to my last few slides, because I know I've talked a lot. And I did tell you that I could easily span this over three hours very easily and go into more detail. But let's talk about iodine, because I'm proposing that that is also a critical mineral for protecting breasts. Now let's see why. Are we deficient? This is another paper that I wrote, and if you want a copy, see my uh, staff, and I'm happy to send you a copy. Now this, look at, oh, I beg your pardon. Let's go back. This is a statement that's made from the archives, because doctors used to use potassium iodide to treat virtually everything. Because guess what? It seemed to work for virtually everything. So what they said was, if ye don't know where, what, and why, prescribe ye then K and I. That's what they used to say. If you don't know what's causing the disease, and you don't know where it's coming from, or why it's there, just prescribe potassium iodide. It'll do the job. But you know, since the advent of thyroid hormones particularly, the notion that we can use potassium iodide or use iodine and wield it therapeutically or preventatively has, has gone out the window. In fact, sometimes when you talk about iodine in a medical forum, it's like someone suddenly started talking about leprosy. That's how much iodine has become almost a phobia, it's something you have to avoid. But doctors used to use it routinely. Now, somewhere we went off track. Iodine. Women with goiters, a visible non-cancerous enlargement of the thyroid, owing to iodine deficiency, have three times greater risk or incidence of breast cancer. A high intake of iodine is associated with a low incidence of breast cancer and a low intake, of, uh, a low intake with a high incidence of breast cancer. Every cell in the body needs and requires iodine to function normally. David Brownstein has written a lot on iodine. Uses it therapeutically to treat his patients with breast cancer as well. I won't dwell on that. Iodine deficiency strongly implicated in cancers of organs normally having a high iodine presence. For example, thyroid, breast, ov ovary, prostate, stomach, pancreas, colon, lung, uh, and lung. So not just breast. Sites of rapid apoptosis, or programmed cell death in the body, are also sites with high iodine levels, incidentally. Uh, uh, Bernard Eskin published over 80 papers over a 30-year period showing that iodine deficiency was linked with an increased risk of both breast and thyroid cancer. Not me saying it. And then, of course, if you look cross-culturally, Japanese women, the average iodine intake is about 13.8 milligrams a day. And they have one of the lowest incidences of breast cancer on the planet. Uh, in addition, Japan has one of the lowest incidences of iodine deficiency, goiter, uh, and hypothyroidism. So that matches. 
Iceland also, they have a high iodine intake, and they also have low rates of goiter and low rates of breast cancer. So there's an association. Two countries with, the low, with low iodine intake, Thailand and Mexico, have high rates of breast cancer. So there is something about iodine which is protective of breasts, ladies, in a similar way to vitamin D. How many of you, is this the first time that you've heard that? Oh, so, you, so I'm preaching to the converted then. All right, good. Well, it's, it's useful revision then. So what are some of the ways that iodine works? Look at some of the actions that iodine has. First of all, it, it, it encourages programmed cell death. In other words, apoptosis in breast cancer cells, that's been demonstrated. So it turns off breast cancer cells. It detoxifies the body from heavy metals, lead and mercury, and also detoxifies the body from xenoestrogens, pesticides, herbicides, industrial chemicals. And I showed you earlier, ladies, one of the things that detoxifies estrogens is iodine. 10 times more potent than ascorbic acid or vitamin C as an antioxidant. I bet you didn't know that. It affects 43 genes involved with cell cycle, growth, proliferation, and differentiation. And some of those are the estrogen regulation genes. So it's very involved with that. Iodine is also a great alkalizing agent, and it can elevate pH. That might also be a useful uh, uh, mechanism of action. Now, so, last few slides and we'll bring this home. About six, seven years ago, I developed something called Breast NutriCheck, which is, as the name suggests, it's a home kit test which allows women to test certain key nutrients, some of which we've already mentioned, from their own home. We can get these kits in and out of every country in the world. Well, we can get them into every country. We can't get them out of Russia. We can get them in, but not out. So that's pretty useless. But, but the, the, the beauty of this is we can make this test available to women anywhere to test are they vulnerable by having low levels of certain key breast health nutrients. So this kit is available. And in fact, the girls will tell you about it. They have information about it. What is in it? What does it test for? Well, it tests for omega-3, which I haven't talked about in that time. Uh, iodine, vitamin D from a finger prick, iodine from urine, and estrogen metabolism. So it, it, from urine, it's able to tell women, are they toxic estrogen producers or not? So this is all in one kit. There are two forms, actually. There's one which is called mini NutriCheck, which is just iodine and vitamin D, and the four component is all four. They cost differently, so it depends on the person's budget. But critically, I always ask women to test at least vitamin D and iodine if they can't do the whole, the whole four. So summarizing some of the things I've said, thermography is a safe and early detection tool for breast cancer. Thermacheck is a computer-assisted cloud-based software that increases precision and reliability of thermography. I pause to say to you doctors in the audience, one of our, my ambitions has always been to make this available to women, not just to bring them to Harley Street, but to have doctors who are open-minded doctors offering this in, from their own practices everywhere. We have doctors in, from India interested. We have doctors in Europe interested in having this. I want to find more doctors across the UK uh, offering this to women, making it more available. 90% so, um, of uh, breast cancer is environmentally triggered. Certain key nutrients we've talked about can reduce risk. Phytochemicals, iodine, vitamin D in particular, we mentioned. Genes can't turn themselves on and off, we said that. Nutrigenetics. Epigenetics is more important. Breast NutriCheck is a home kit test that we use to establish nutritional risk. Now, now I'm gonna show you what we've been able to achieve in-house. So, about, uh, again, about six, seven years ago, based on doing a lot of breast NutriCheck tests, based on identifying nutritional deficiencies in women who had abnormal thermograms, I created a couple of bespoke nutritional supplements, one called Dr. E NutriPlus, excuse me, but forgive the Dr. E, but uh, Dr. E NutriPlus and Estra Balance. And I basically now use these routinely with women who have abnormal thermograms. Now I'm going to show you the transition of three women with abnormal thermograms. So here's the first one. This is a woman who, and I'm only showing you her abnormal breast. 
So this is her thermogram of her right breast. And where you see red, that's significant temperature difference, okay? Yellow is moderate temperature difference. So the, 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 this is the cooling map. It just shows that all of those areas cool because the correct way to do thermography is to have a cold challenge to see if there is an abnormal response to cooling. So if you're going to do thermography correctly, you should have what we call a dynamic thermal challenge so that you look at the response to cooling as well. So all of those areas cooled, but she had a, t a four rating. One and two is normal. Four and five are high risk. She had a four rating on the right breast. And it, this is her between December and October. She's now normal. Yes, she still has some moderate heat at her nipple, but she's basically gone from high risk to low risk in nine months. Here's another one, same scenario, 53-year-old woman this time, uh, and she has a TH5 in her right breast. All those areas cool, but here she is between April and October, six months later, having a normal scan. And here's the third one. I could show you more, but I've just picked three out. This is a woman who did have a family history of breast cancer, age 60, and she is a TH4, this time on her left breast. Again, the areas do cool, but here she is with no thermal activity six months later. Now, I propose to you that is the way to change the game with breast cancer risk. Non-invasively, non-toxic, non-hormonally, intervening with only key nutrients and important lifestyle changes, and within six months, and I'm seeing this, 95% of abnormal thermograms are returning to normal. Now you may say, well, some of those people may not have had cancer. They may just have had something else benign going on in breast. You'd be right, you'd be right. But what I'm saying is, these are women, if we left them, are going to be at increasing risk over the years. Now, ethically, why should we wait? Let's just intervene non-invasively and change this woman's risk. And then when she's reached a normal scan, bring her back 12 months later and monitor her breast thermally to make sure they're remaining normal. That's the way to change the game. So that's what we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen. My mission is to make this available, not just countrywide, but Europe-wide, worldwide. I need help to get there. So my appeal to you who have attended this evening, if you're interested in helping us with this mission, you come and see us, you keep in touch with us, you give us your email, you stay on our mailing list, and you, and you come and bring your friends to the talks and, and just help to create the awareness of, of this work that's being done. That's who I am, that's the name of our practice, those are our contact details, but there's some leaflet information as well floating around that the staff, my staff will let you have. It's taken me longer than I proposed, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Hope you've enjoyed it. Are there any, uh, are there any questions, any burning questions? Yes. Um, hi, thank you, that was a great, great talk. I just wondered, you said Switzerland is not using mammography for screening tool anymore. What are they doing instead? I don't know. No, honestly, I, I, someone, a patient came in to see me about two weeks ago and said, oh, did you know that they're using thermography? And I hadn't, to be honest, I hadn't heard that. I haven't confirmed it. If they are, I'm very pleased. But don't take that as read. I'm checking that out. But they've... Um, they're either not doing anything and they're just investigating when a woman presents with a lump, or they may be using thermography, but that remains to be confirmed. I hope that's right. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, could you please elaborate a little bit more um, regarding thermography and um, breast ultrasound, maybe? Mammography and? Uh, no, um, uh, thermography and um, ultrasound, breast ultrasound. Right. So. Ultrasound uh, is a useful tool, but it's not a useful screening tool. So it's a very blunt instrument. The main use of ultrasound is when you have a lump to tell you is it solid or cystic. 
it gives us, and we can look at the architecture of the breast, because there are certain benign patterns and certain malign patterns on an ultrasound. You really need a biopsy, and often you'll have an ultrasound guided biopsy. So as a screening tool, it's even blunter than mammography. It doesn't show calcification, and you need to have a lump before you can see it. So again, it's late detection. What we're trying to argue is we've got to pick changes up before they become a lump big enough to feel. Uh, lower than mammography, because mammography is about 70%. It, it's, not, it, it's not utilized as a screening tool, though. So talking about sensitivity and specificity doesn't really apply because it's not used as a screening tool. It's used as an investigative tool. Uh, there was a question here as well. Hello. Hi. It was excellent, really. I learned a lot. Um, I wanted to know if a thermography detects calcifications. You just started talking about that. Yeah. I'm from New York, so I'm used to having mammograms every yes. year, followed by a sonogram. Yes. Um, so I'm trying to see if this is yeah. for me. Yeah. The answer is no, it doesn't. It does not pick up calcification. The only thing that picks up calcification is mammography. Okay, so um, that's one of the reasons why women have been overtreated, though, because a lot of what is calcification is represents a benign process, not a malignant process. So uh, it, it's this picking up calcification that's led to a lot of the overtreatment. So, and again, uh, yes, it picks up calcification, but in terms of uh, being a sensitive screening tool, it's late, too late detection mammography based on all the things that I, I've said. But it's the only thing that picks up calcification. MRI doesn't reliably pick it up either. Thank you. Because calcium is radio dense, you see, and that's why it shows on, uh, on ionizing, uh, under ionizing radiation. You had a question? No. Oh. Yes. Um, <laughs> My background is I run a cancer charity that supports integrative medicine. So um, we've done a lot of work with Nigel, and we certainly recommend um, this as a screening tool. Quite interestingly, about two weeks ago, there's a number of closed forums. I don't know if some of you are on them. Um, I actually posed a question about mammography, just a very general question. And it's quite interesting to see, I would say 90% of the people that responded to it said, it saved my life. So it poses a question about the education of what we're talking about this evening and how we get people to look at this as an alternative tool. And it's, as Nigel was saying, it's not that it's, um, mammography is not um, a tool that can be used in the right way. It's just this generalization that this is, you know, you reach 50 in this country and you're bullied into having a mammogram and you're not told about the radiation that comes with a mammogram. I've scanned the leaflet a hundred times and there is not one piece of information on that that talks about radiation. So people need to wise up. I mean, obviously, again, talking to the converted here, people understand this, but we do need to let women know about this and for them to make a decision based on the right information. So it's not saying don't have it, but if you're going to go down there, you know what you're actually getting yourself in for. And I think it's only people that are sitting in here or that come to people like Nigel, and we certainly as a charity, need to get this message out to people because it's pretty scary. You know, the statistics speak for themselves. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Well said. First question, actually. Is there an argument for using your supplementation if you start to demonstrate some of the risks, irrespective of whether you want to undergo the screening? In other words, if you're getting old and you have some of the risks you've identified, yeah. and, they, and, the, and the patient doesn't want to actually undergo the screening, whether they yeah. or whether they, uh, maybe they can't afford to. Or they can't afford yeah. to. I would say yes. Yeah. If they, if, if, I, well, I would, I would make a bolder statement than that, even. I would say, <clears throat> if women didn't want to, couldn't afford to have a thermogram, I would, I would, one of the things I would do is optimize women's vitamin D and their iodine levels. And if they just did those two things, I believe they would significantly reduce their risk of breast cancer just by doing those, being proactive about those two things. So you're right. You, you could just uh, advise people to correct those things, and I, I think it would translate into reduced risk. It would be great to have a cohort of women doing that and follow them, but it will take years to, 
to show the change in incidence. Um, what I'm, those pictures I showed you of before and afters, I'm gathering all of that data. When I have several hundreds of showing that transition, that's going to be published. Yeah, I'll fight tooth and nail to get that published mm. because it, it's, it's information that, that women need to be aware of. If I can say that I start from a, a position of being a fan, I've had three with you, I, continue, I will continue to have them. When I talk to my friends and my family about it, yeah. one of the biggest things that stops them coming is the cost. So this is a plea, please, please, can you keep the cost as low as possible, could you reduce the cost? Because I've had three already and I want to continue to have them. I choose to divert my money because I value it. Because uh, this came up uh, as part of our uh, discussion of how we move this out in a bigger way. Because, you know, uh, that's the cost we charge in Harley Street. You know, what if you were doing this somewhere where, um, you know, in a more rural place, uh, or in a, in, a, in a poorer country where they can't afford that, obviously the price point would have to change. One of our ambitions has always been to bring the price down. <clears throat> it's, it's partly volume led, like all business. It's as the volume increases, the price is gonna come down. But I, we, I do re genuinely take on board what you've just asked because it's one of my ambitions to get the price down and make it more affordable so that more women can choose to have it. You're absolutely right. Cost of factor. I mean, I'm aware too that even if we have a mammogram, even though we don't pay for it, yeah. there's a cost involved. It's not yeah. that it's a free service, so here it's just yeah. not available to us. Yeah. But it made me think to ask you, do you know of any um, sort of medical insurance programs or any things that would cover this? Because um, that would be helpful to know. Yeah. Unfortunately, no. As far as I know, um, uh, we've had one or two patients who've managed to get cover, but it's not consistent. So um, there isn't a, a particular insurance company that I can tell you would cover this. It's been very hit and miss. Now again, that's one of the things that in the future, making this available and more cost effective, if, it, if this can be covered by insurance, it's going to be better, more women can choose to have it. So that again is one of our ambitions, but you know, uh, we're not a big team. It's me, my business associate and uh, 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 and three, my practice manager, uh, and three part-time that do the scanning and also do my admin. So we're not a, a big team and, and you know, there's only so much you can do. And you know us men are not good at multitasking in any case. But, um, but it is one of the, oh, you, you're gonna make a point um, on this? No, just as a charity, we do actually help fund the multiple yeah. Um, so um, you That's can go cool. to Yes to Life and you can call their helpline and you can apply for funding. You can apply for funding for anything on the complementary and alternative side of um, what, you, what you choose to do. We're not telling you what to do at all. But you, So thermography is covered under that. So we can't cover the whole cost because we're a small charity. Um, but it is one of the things that you can apply to us for. If you want. Yeah. Do, uh, the question was, when is when is this when does this become? At what point does this become part of uh, like a national screening program? So it's offered uh, as as a screening tool. And the answer, yeah, uh, the answer to that. Who knows? People like Professor Baum. It was my mentor. Yeah, Mike Baum. Mike Mike Baum, as you know. He, he, was, he was critical to bringing in the, the, the mammographic screening program into the UK. He's now gone completely full circle, and now you can hear lectures of him on YouTube explaining why mammography is not such, <laughs> such a good thing. So he, he's got Peter Gurch, he's another leading light, the Cochrane guy. Those are two people that we need on board to help sort of change thought process because Despite what I've said, there is this thing in medicine, this ostrich in sand thing, which is ignoring the data and it's just saying this is the gold standard, we're sticking to it. It's like it's an unmovable uh, mountain. So that's what we're up against, is, is changing views on what this is. And it allows me to repeat something I, we discussed earlier, which is that every, if you talk to doctors about this generally, they can start to compare it against mammography. 
how reliable is it in diagnosing? Diagnosing, this diagnosing. Well, mammography doesn't diagnose either. Neither does ultrasound, neither does MRI. You have to stick a needle in and get a... So none of the screening procedures diagnose for a start. So that's the first part. Second, this is talking more to breast health monitoring than it is to diagnosing breast cancer because it's showing you a woman who has a stressed breast. Now, some of that may not be precancerous or cancerous, but it's a stressed breast. So if you turn the argument round and say, this is a breast health monitoring tool, not a cancer screening tool, it changes the way you look at it. And so, and so that's what I argue, is, and that's what doctors need to hear, is that look at this differently. How do you not monitor if a woman has a tumor that you can see, but how do you monitor whether that woman's breast tissue is healthy or not? And then, if it's not, you intervene non-invasively and change it. And that, for me, is a big story, because I think, I think this will lead to a change in the incidence of breast cancer. It really will. And that's, uh, and as I say, once I've got a bit more data, um, I, I'm, I'm aiming to publish this, but it, it, it should be available as a national, uh, on a national screening basis. But how long will it take before that is? Don't know. Will the Swiss do it? And if they do it, will other people wake up and say, okay, well, they've done it. Let's think about, I don't know. That's a really good question that we have to end on, I'm afraid. So, Zoo, you had a few quick announcements. Yes. So, um, thank you, Dr. Eccles, for such an inspiring talk. Um, I learn new things, even myself, and I've been working there for almost three years. So. As well, we have uh, some products that Dr. Eccles mentioned. So, we have the, the Breast NutriCheck, Breast NutriCheck Minis, which um, the home test kits, as well as uh, Nutricell, which, uh, which is a vitamin D and iodine supplement, and K2 in there as well, and Estro Balance, which has DIM. So this is our team. This is the team. So if you wish to speak to anyone about this. And Murtash. And Murtash in the background. Murtash, if, you want, if anyone's interested in the Thermacheck system, Murtash is the yeah. man's talk team. Um, in any case, we have prepared some canapes for you. Of course, there's Prosecco, so please help yourself. And uh, thank you everyone for coming.